Now get this meeting started. Um, I'm Councilmember Jose Wiesar. I've been joined by Councilmember Mitch Englander. This is a Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Um, we'll start off with uh, the director's report. We'll receive and file that item. Um, item number four, we'll put on consent, uh, adopt the motion, and move it on to council. I don't know if that has, yeah, that does have a number of speakers. Let, okay, we'll take that item up. Uh, is anybody opposed to this? Okay, there are people opposed to this? Okay, so let's take that up because we have, okay, we'll take that item up when it, Item number seven, we will uh, continue for the request of the applicant. That's the building at 1100 South Broadway. And item number eight, we will continue. Uh, that is 5746 North Sepulveda. Item seven and eight are being continued. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, let's take up um, item number one, please. Um, item one, Councilman, is a communication from the mayor relative to the appoint, the reappointment, rather, of Ms. Maria Guadalupe Cabildo to the City Planning Commission. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cabildo. If you could please come up to the um, podium and welcome to the Plum Committee. Uh, it's, I think it was just nearly one year ago since you were here and yes. appointed to the City Planning Commission, and and um, mm -hmm. we just want to hear what what you what, what do you what have you th your thoughts on your one year about the CPC and anything you suggest that it could improve uh, the processes we have or any of your thoughts in your one year of service on the uh, Citywide Planning Commission. So welcome. Well, thank you. Um, again, Maria Cabildo, um, I just want to mention I'm a proud resident of uh, Eagle Rock and I've done much of my work on uh, in Boyle Heights. Um, the time that I've spent on the Planning Commission has been uh, really a very interesting time in terms of, as you know, the caseload of reviewing a lot of cases with a lot of um, um, a lot of reports and a lot of EIRs, and I was uh, uh, been kind of uh, spending a lot, way too much time reading that stuff. But uh, the things that I've really been impressed by is just the diligence of the planning department staff, and I am really impressed with the things that um, the planning department has chosen to take on, and the city has uh, chosen to take on with the projects around Recode LA, and especially the plan for a healthy Los Angeles. I think that the uh, approval of, or the, uh, I guess we recommended that uh, the plan for a healthy Los Angeles come to you in the near future for approval, and I feel that that is really setting the stage for Los Angeles not just being a leader in California but being a leader throughout the United States on issues of health and equity and I think the city is heading in the right direction and I think the planning department staff is really up to that challenge. Great, thank you. Any questions, Mr. Engender? Um, well, I was going to give you a hard time okay. for uh, attending UCLA but but you also <laughs> it was, you also went, it was went, graduate school. Also went to MIT in Columbia and uh, some others, so you balanced it. You I balanced it out. You know, and, um, and UCLA was the last school I attended. And, and, so. I, and I do want to give you credit for having to serve with Richard Katz. So Thank I'll you. give you credit for that as well. Okay. Oh, he's, I a dear, often he's a dear friend. Yeah. So, um, no, I, this, you're actually you're impressive in, in terms of uh, everything you have done. Um, but I, it, would be, it would be nice if we, we were able to take the commissioner's bios. I know they're posted on the Internet and actually share them with the public that are here because it's really incredible and truly impressive what, you, what you've accomplished at such a young age and uh, continue to give back to the, to the city. So, um, no, you've, you definitely have my support and I appreciate all the work you've done. Thank you very much, Councilman Thank Englander. You. Any other questions or comments? No, so with that, we'll send this off to the uh, full council and thank you for your service. And when will this be in council? August 26, Tuesday. August 26, Tuesday. So we'll see you there. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for your service. Next item. Um, next item, Councilman, is item two is a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Robert on to the Planning Commission. Mr. On here, if you could please come up to the podium and uh, bienvenido. Le doy las uh, saludos que está aquí. It says here in your resume that you're conversational in Spanish. So. Oh, that was like <laughs> 10 years ago. It's oh, 10 years updated, ago. Yeah. Okay. 
I think if you live in LA, everybody's conversational in Spanish. You hear it uh, here and there. But uh, again, like Ms. Cabildo, you are, are uh, here in just a short year. You fulfilled the term of a pre previous commissioner. So we just want to hear your, your thoughts on your service one year and uh, what you think of it sure. and how we could improve communication, if at all, and uh, any other thoughts you may want to share with us. Well, good afternoon, council members. I'd like to, first of all, thank you for having me today. Um, it's been almost a year now since I've served on the Planning Commission, and uh, it's been a, just an honor and a tremendous experience um, just seeing all the projects come before us, uh, having a chance to hear from the community as well as the development community, and working with staff in order to uh, come, with the, come together for uh, the best results possible on behalf of the city of L.A., um, as you probably have heard, we had a very robust discussion um, this past week. Uh, we had an equity day where we were able to hear from various experts, um, and I think we have a tremendous opportunity moving forward uh, to do some really uh, forward-thinking and cutting-edge uh, progressive, uh, implement some progressive ideas um, to do things that, uh, to think of things in a different way as we move forward. Um, look forward to uh, many planning, uh, I'm sorry, policy initiatives moving forward, um, mainly Recode F, the Recode LA effort, which is going to be a tremendous uh, opportunity, but also an enormous task that's coming before us. So looking forward to continuing my service on behalf of the city of LA. Great. Thank you. Any questions, Scott? Mr. Anglander? USC, huh? That's right. <laughs> All right. He's got my vote. No, um, and uh, you also survived redistricting commission, so... Just, just, just barely. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, th I want to thank you for your continued uh, support and uh, work on behalf of the residents of Los Angeles as well. Thank and you very much. Certainly have my support. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments? No. Well, thank. Thank you very much. We'll move this item to full council. Um, what date? Twenty-six as well. Okay, the twenty-six. We'll see you there. Thank, thank you very you much. For your service. Thank you. Next item. Item three, Councilman, is a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Ms. Lydia Mather to the South Valley APC. Thank you. Ms. Mather here. Ms. Mather, welcome. And this is a recommendation for the South Valley Area Planning Commission, uh, one uh, for CD6, Martinez. Um, thank you and welcome. Um, anything you'd like to share with the committee and your thoughts uh, uh, as you embark on this? Well, just that uh, the last five years have been extraordinary. Um, really, I think we do good work at the area planning commissions, uh, and it's been a privilege to serve, and I'm honored to be asked to continue to serve. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, we had the opportunity uh, to, to get together on, on an occasion. On, uh, in, with, with the APCs, and they're so far different than the CPCs, um, and one of the things is uh, that I was always concerned about, and particularly as we've seen in some of these controversial projects, first and foremost, the stuff that comes before you is the most heated, controversial, you know, uh, localized, typically angry constituents, residents, or developers. Neither one of them walk out either, you know, somebody's always incredibly unhappy. Sometimes that does happen. <laughs> um, and... A lot of the, the times it's incredibly difficult to navigate. And so from my experience and, and, uh, and not only watching and attending various meetings, and, and my hat's off to you for, for what you often have to put up with as well to come to a decision. Well, it, it's, a, it's about educating people. And, and we find that if we can find a calm way to make both sides understand, sometimes that's never going to happen because sure. they're so angry. Yeah. But we can always come to some kind of compromise and something where they'll work it out. I know sometimes I get cases, I read them through at home, I figure, oh, I'm going to go this way. And you walk in there and you hear everything and you have to completely abandon your preconceived notions. Yeah, and oftentimes it doesn't even end there. And we'll continue litigation in other places. But um, having said that, it's one of the things that uh, I pushed for in this last year's budget, pushed hard, was to get attorneys back to APCs. That would and, be so grand. <laughs> and so that it looks like that's happened and happening and being funded. Excellent. And, uh, so hopefully we'll get you some support we as really you support need, us. We really need that. So I mean, I there have been some cases that... You get your packet, and beforehand you're going. How do we how do we Great. navigate this without an attorney present? Fortunately, we have an attorney on our commission, yes. which helps a little bit. 
helps a little bit. But yeah, but it, so but it would so be better that, to have somebody, somebody there. independent. Um, I appreciate your service, and I know you cover some of my district as well. And yes, I do. Uh, and I appreciate uh, you've always had an open mind and uh, approach things very fairly, and that's all we ever ask. Well, so. it's important to not come with an agenda. You have to have ears and be able to see the overview of what's going on, Absolutely. and then try to help people work through that as you come to your decision. So. Yeah. That's thank you for, for offering your services once again. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll uh, move on to council without objection. 27th? 26, sir. 26. 26. We'll see you at full council. See you next 26. week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next item, please. Item number four. Uh, yes, Councilman. Item four is a motion. LaBanche Cedillo is instructing the planning department uh, to initiate consideration of the Oswald Bartlett home as a historic cultural monument. Thank you, and we are, uh, um, we were inclined to support this on consent. We did have a number of cards in support, and did, but I don't see any that says here that's in opposition. Do, do you have one, or? Okay, all right. Well, I'll just go through the cards then, and, and um, people, I just want to make sure that the individual who said they were opposed, they, did you submit a card, sir? You did? Okay. Okay. That's fine. So we'll have staff come up first, please. Yes, good afternoon, council members. Ken Bernstein with the Department of City Planning and Office of Historic Resources. This is a council initiation of a historic cultural monument application uh, via council motion, uh, Laban Cedillo, for the Oswald Bartlett House at 1829 North Kenmore, Kenmore Avenue. Uh, recently, information came to light on this property that uh, this is a house designed by the significant architect Albert C. Martin, who was also associated with the uh, design of LA City Hall, the Million Dollar Theater, the Wilshire uh, May Company building. So this motion would be referred to staff. Uh, this is also, uh, we've received a separate nomination submitted to the Office of Historic Resources, and this is separately on the uh, Cultural Heritage Commission agenda for this Thursday, uh, August uh, 21st. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Eric Lieberman. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Lieberman. Um, I'm uh, here, I rep represent the property owner, and uh, I wanted to just make a couple of quick points. We'd submitted a letter for you for your review. Um, we are not here to necessarily oppose the designation of historic. We're not here to argue that this house is or is not uh, historic, but I think it's important for you to understand the process in which the applicant went through on this property for the proposed development that if this house is determined to be historic, it's going to block this development uh, completely from happening. Uh, last year, we consulted with the Office of Historic Resources. Uh, we met with the council office, went to the neighborhood council. Uh, we, this, this was an issue that we had brought up that we wanted to make sure we weren't going to be in this situation down the road, and, and here we are anyway. Um, the, uh, the question of this historic integrity was brought up. We, we talked to Historic Resources was not on Survey LA. We got confirmation from uh, Ken Bernstein that uh, it was not of historic significance, and we moved forward. Uh, the applicant has subsequently had public hearings. Uh, there were no opposition to those public hear at those public he uh, hearings. And um, we he moved forward in good faith based on uh, the fact that there was no opposition. Nobody brought up this issue. Uh, and he went through building plan check. He played all his fees. Uh, he ready, was ready to go. Uh, he had put off putting uh, demolition on this building um, purely for strategic and financial reasons uh, and was ready to go, was stopped uh, by the building inspector actually. Uh, we did not know or were not made aware that this was being looked at over the last several months that uh, nobody informed us that this was going on. We would certainly would have appreciated that knowledge so that we could have been involved in the process. Uh, and uh, so I wanted you to be aware that there is some history here, that this is not an issue that was swept under the rug or that anybody knew about. It's something that's come up just recently. And there's an unfortunate circumstance here where this applicant has spent significant resources 
uh, between three and four hundred thousand dollars getting a project ready. Th thank uh, you. And you're the representative for the applicant. Uh, for the entitlement, that's correct. For the entitlement. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan Murdoch. Alan Murdoch. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the developer. He was representing me. And as he said, um, we just became aware of this, and this is something we, we didn't know. What I want to bring up and what I'd like to go on the record for is from the time we purchased the property well over a year ago, we engaged publicly with the council's office the neighborhood council, neighbors. We got approvals publicly from the neighborhood council before we moved to planning. In submitting our planning application, I was concerned, this is an old, I'm not an expert, this is an old house, I want to make sure that there's no problems here. I contacted, and our group contacted the Office of Historic Resources, and we were, it was confirmed in writing that, by, by, by Ken as a matter of fact, that this, this is good to go. There's no need for historical analysis. This is a non-eligible historic resource. It didn't show up on Survey LA. Based on all of my diligence and, and, and our want to be as transparent as possible, this was no sweeping under the rug or trying to dodge anything. We went through that process in a public hearing. There were no opposition. And we engaged with the city. So what I'd like to say here is I don't know where this is going, but I'm, I, I'm a, a, an initiator in this city. I, I take it upon myself and my company to invest in the city. I expect at, at, at the base level to have some form of cooperation or accuracy in the information that we have from the city. And this seemed to be not the case again and again and again. Despite the public hearings we approved, despite no appeals, despite all of the public outreach, despite my contacting the Office of Historic Resources and have confirmation in writing that this is not, not a historical resource. And so, based on all of this information that we were given by the city, based on all of the community outreach that we did, and all of the approvals that we, that we obtained, I moved forward and we obtained building permits, I paid plan check fees, I paid permit fees, and so we're into this a, a considerable amount of money, and I think that should be considered Thank given my, my process here. So we submitted um, something for, for the commissioners to read um, that's a, a letter, um, an itemization of the events, just so it's clear what we did, what we went through, and who we spoke to. And then additionally, and lastly, um, you know, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that, that, that nothing in the city or in this room should happen in a vacuum. That while this is an important consideration, historic one that I think I'm not an expert, I would like to look into it as well. I don't know the findings. There are other things at stake, namely over 50 jobs that are ready to be created. Okay. There, there's housing that the city needs. And okay, if you could wrap it up now, I, I gave okay. some leniency since you're uh, uh, here. Usually we allow one minute. So I see. If you okay. Could wrap it up, well, I appreciate your consideration and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And just as a reminder, our public speakers have one minute. We gave some leniency there since they were uh, directly impacted here with the application. Um, John Gerardo, after John. Is Abraham Sokamonian? John Girodo speaking for Hollywood Heritage. 
Hollywood Heritage is speaking in support of Council Member LaBonge's motion to nominate the A.C. Martin designed Oswald Bartlett House as a Los Angeles historic cultural monument. Council Member LaBonge's identification of the intact fabric of the neighborhood is key in respecting this 100 year old property, built in 1914, the very year that Hollywood came into its proper of its own. The context of the neighborhood still exists. This motion is potentially saving the historic fabric of this neighborhood. And as the City Council recently restored staffing of four new hires for the Department of City Planning specifically to address historic neighborhoods and HPOZs, I think Mr. LaBonge's motion is right on target. Thank you. Abraham Sogomonian and then Doug Haynes. Good afternoon. Um, I passed out something with a picture in the front because I wanted you guys to all see the beautiful house. And there, on the list in the back of that picture, you'll see a list of all the different um, things that A.C. Martin has done. It actually came from this book. Uh, so it's actually, it's really shocking actually to look at that list and uh, sort of walk around the city and realize that 70% of the high rises you see and in, in, in the vast number of uh, buildings are actually designed by A.C. Martin. It's actually just confusing. So. It's, it's actually, um, you'll see the, the first building on, on that list is actually a 1904 hamburger building, and Oswald Bartlett was the buyer for that. That's the connection between them. And um, it's, it's very, very rare. All the properties you see on that list that are in the index that I've given you are all commercial properties. So actually, it's very rare to actually see a house. It's, it's just significant. It's, it's hugely, hugely rare. And and it's somewhat magical. And what's really interesting is, I know the former the owner of the house. He actually kept the house in really excellent thank you. condition. And thank I just want to thank much. everybody for uh, helping preserve this. Uh, thank you. Uh, the house, thank you. Doug Haynes, Rosemary DeMonte. Good afternoon, my name is Doug Haynes. Uh, real quick, as far as the comments from the owner of the property, the process begins with honesty. And there was an honesty at the beginning of this process. There was false statements basically about how this property had nothing on it of historic or any sort of cultural or architectural significance. I got called by a neighbor that this property was slated for demolition. I asked Charlie to look up the original permit. It took him five minutes to find out that A.C. Martin was the original architect. Um, that's how long it took to find out. There was no due diligence, and I would say that Potentially, it was hidden under the rug because of the significance of this house. I want to thank Tom LaBanche and also Councilman Cedillo for recognizing in this motion, which says it all, um, what the process really was. Previously, we had the Paul Williams house before. That was a case where it was by right. This was discretionary. CEQA was not followed properly, and it should go through Cultural Heritage Commission where that debate can occur. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rosemary DeMonte and Charles Fisher. Hi, Rosemary DeMonte. I am uh, on the planning committee of the Los Feliz Neighborhood Council, which this home is in. And I want to say mea culpa. Uh, I, of course, was not at the original uh, uh, planning meeting. I was at a wedding. So nobody knew that this house had cultural standing, and then we were in the dark. And I feel sorry for the property owner, if this is the truth, that he was told by the city department, you know, that follows this, that it's, it wasn't uh, of a historical comment. I think anything that's old and in a wonderful old neighborhood should be very researched, and from now on, I will do my due diligence on any property that is, because all houses are getting raised in our neighborhood, and they're old homes, and I am really worried about this rush to crush. So thank you very much, and uh, I think the city might owe this man some money. Charles Fisher. Good afternoon. As Doug Hames mentioned, I was the one that did the research. I was contacted, it was actually three weeks ago tomorrow that I was first contacted about this house. Monday, I went down to Building and Safety, and it took me 40 seconds to find the, the uh, original building permit that showed A.C. Martin's name. Um, I'm saying that the owner did not do full due diligence, because have I been a developer, I would have had that original building permit in hand before I even called the Office of Historic Resources and ask, uh, this house, by the way, it was designed by this A.C. Martin. That would have been a different answer, because any A.C. Martin house is such a precious 
part of our uh, fabric in Los Angeles. They're just so rare. Uh, there is one other that was declared. It's a very different house on St. Andrew's Place. It's a mission revival. It shows the um, ability to study Mr. Martin's work. And uh, this house is uh, being a, a, a colonial revival with uh, arts and crafts influence is a very different design from that one. But had they done their due diligence, they would have found this, and they wouldn't have spent all that money. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, I understand uh, Renee Weitzer from CD4 is here. Do you wish to add anything? or really. you got Okay, good. Any questions or comments? Um, Ms. Tanglander? Yeah, does the motion um, call for ad adoption of the historic staff? Please come no. Yeah. It's oh, a just a study it's a study and it has to be presented to the cultural heritage commission and does that study then come back here as yes. well? yes okay um in light of just what we've heard and um i, I think if we could ask uh the city attorney that when that comes back with the report for an opinion as well the one thing i didn't see in the package that um, the applicant said was in the package was the memo from uh from Ken's office? Um, did, did I'm happy to address that. Again, okay. uh, Ken Bernstein. We were uh, emailed uh, about a year ago by the applicant, and what Mr. Lieberman and Mr. Murdoch uh, indicated is accurate. We, they reached out to us in doing their due diligence. Uh, we indicated at the time that this was not a property that had been identified as significant through Survey LA, our citywide historic resources survey, and we had completed the survey field work in that area. Having said that, um, just to, to clarify, you know, we are surveying through Survey LA a city of 880,000 separate parcels, and uh, we are doing considerable outreach, uh, community engagement as part of that process, casting the net as widely as we can to get information before our survey teams go out into the field. Um, at that time when we did the survey, um, we were not aware that this property was, uh, that this house was designed by A.C. Martin. And we do not have the research. We are not doing detailed building permit uh, research on all 880,000 properties of the city. Well, we let would, me ask you this question. Be, no, of course. Yeah. And, and, and I, actually, the work you do is phenomenal. I don't know how you do everything you do. You're, um, and I have a great respect for, for not only the work you do, but, but you personally and what you do. Um, are all A.C. Martin homes um, automatically... No, uh, but one of, one of the criteria for historic designation at all levels, whether City Historic Cultural Monument or for the National Register or California Register, is whether uh, a particular home is a notable work of a master architect. That's the language that our local ordinance uses. So I think it's acknowledged that A.C. Martin would be considered a master architect. The question here when this comes back to the Cultural Heritage Commission and to the council is, uh, you know, is this a, a notable work of his, and does it uh, retain sufficient uh, That's what I was integrity ask. to convey about, that significance? About the retention and the, and the maintenance and the upkeep of the property, according to the applicant's documents as well. And I'm not trying to argue one way or the other. I'm just trying to gather facts and making a decision. Um, noted numerous changes over the years, um, significant structural changes. Uh, that's something that the commission will take into yes. deep consideration as well. Yes, that's right. Uh, okay, and um, so they'll vet all that. Uh, so when it comes back here, just because of the time frame, and I want to make sure that it looks, um, it's crystal clear that, you know, uh, they just happen to overlap in terms of the applicant's process for entitlements and um, the city's interest in preserving the property uh, historically. Um, there's, there's an overlap of, of time. Uh, if we can get a city attorney opinion back on that as well, um, I would ask for that. In other words, do we have that ability, even if there is a, there's an application pending and somebody's gone through that process, neighborhood council, public hearing, you know, are they, because they'd mentioned uh, that they'd spent a lot of money on that. Um, and I'm not saying that they should have done more due diligence or more work at the beginning or not. The fact is we, we found out when we found out through this process. Um, so the real question is, are, are we, are we, do we have any liability there at all? And I'd like to have an opinion back on that. Not for this particular case in an isolated 
incident, but it's, this has come up before, and so it'd be good just to know as policymakers where we stand. Good. Thank you. And so, um, if there's no objection, we'll, we'll, oh, Mr. Cedillo. Okay, I think. At this moment, it's $300,000. Uh, one part I'm missing here, how do they get compensated? Do they get reimbursed? And what happens to their kind of lost opportunity or, and their projected profit that they had anticipated on the project? Do they, does the developer get reimbursed by the city? Terry Coppin, City Attorney's Office. M maybe you want me to come back and talk about this and I can talk about it in closed session if you're talking about liability issues or not. Um, so I mean I can tell you with Mr. Bernstein's assistance what the cultural heritage ordinance provides and how the process works which has nothing to do with the question that that you just raised. Could I if I could <clears throat> Mr. Cedillo um, I appreciate that question as well and that's where I was sort of going with it. I'm, I'm glad you articulated that in that way. When this comes back um, with the commission's report and the city attorney's opinion on this, can we have it agendized as a possible closed session so we can get into that? Not again on this particular property, so I don't want the councilmen to think you know we're looking at that from that perspective, but this is not the first uh, and it certainly won't be the last. It'd be good to know where these things do come up in the process, where we stand, and it's certainly not fair, and I don't think it's, it's fair to the, either the neighbors, the people that would protect these properties, and or the applicants spending all their effort and energy and the neighborhood council members who have gone out and vetted these issues and asked all these. It's not fair to anybody. So it would be good to know if we can, if the chair would uh, sure, schedule we, it as a possible closed session when it comes back. I would be back. happy to. It doesn't mean we will, depending upon the issues raised by the city attorney's office. We may or may not do that. Yeah. One thing I did want to add, again, uh, Ken Bernstein with the department, is that um, given our understanding of how this has played out and obviously the fact that the uh, applicant is, uh, the owner is being significantly um, delayed by the consideration of this council motion. We are taking every effort to expedite this through our Cultural Heritage Commission process and to resolve the issue one way or another as quickly as possible so that uh, uh, whatever happens with this site can move forward with a greater sense of certainty as, as we go. So we have, we have actually scheduled this for our Cultural Heritage Commission meeting this Thursday. We have separately received a nomination, uh, separate from the council motion, a nomination was submitted to our office by Mr. Fisher and we have expedited that for commission's consideration. So, how I feel about this at the moment. So that's a really quick way of cleaning up the milk spilled on the floor right but the fact for as far as I get from what I've heard today is this man these developers were told you've got no problem you evidently in an email told them you had no problem you were very clear to us today about the challenges you have in making those assessments and that you said that it's difficult and you guys don't have the resources and there's all these properties in the city. Did you convey that same kind of uncertainty to this man in your email when you said there's not a problem, it's not on the survey? Because that's very important. Because if you tell someone you don't have a problem and it's not on the survey and they go forward, it just seems to me incredibly problematic that they make these investments, that they think they're okay, and now we're going to do all that we can to say, well, you know what, uh, we're going to really be in a hurry to let you know that you weren't okay. And it just seems a, a little too late on behalf of the city for us to do that. We do that repeatedly, as, as it was indicated. We talked about the other house where the man was ready, to, you know, the people were coming to his house to stop him from doing his own work on his own house. And, and we just have to, we have to stop that. We can't be at a point where we tell people you can go forward and then after come here and then say, oh, you can't go forward. I don't doubt that this house is gonna be deemed historical. I don't know, are there any AC Martin houses that aren't deemed historical or of some value? 
have come here under some dispute and that we've made a determination that they're not. Council Member Cedillo, the under the Cultural Heritage Ordinance, the Cultural Heritage Commission is just a recommending body. Mm -hmm. So it's the council who actually makes the designation. And have we? No, because the process that's triggered right now is the investigation. I got that. I then, got it, that. It, then it goes to oh. staff makes a recommendation to the commission. Commission hears the matter, makes a recommendation, depends on whether it's initiated by council or by uh, an applicant, and then the ultimate decision maker is the council. So if the council finds that this particular or any, any building doesn't meet the criteria, then the council has the discretion to reject the nomination and then it's it's dead right so I'm asking a specific question so have we ever with respect to any properties that were built by AC Martin gone against recommendations by the various entities that you described um, councilman I don't know the answer to that I uh, I think actually in fact one of the um, uh, arguments for this nomination that's been presented is that there are very few single-family homes designed by AC Martin that are remaining. So I don't know that, in fact, we even have a, uh, an AC Martin home that has been designated a uh, single-family residence. We have other buildings, as I indicated, the Million Dollar Theater, the Wilshire May Company building, LA City Hall itself. But uh, I think one of the arguments is that this is a rare example of a single-family home that he designed. Right. So I don't know the answer. Right. Yeah. So, but do you know the answer? Has there been any building then by the architects AC Martin that that this council has gone against recommendations? Um, I don't recall one, but I don't know for certain. Happy shops he visited. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, look, they're our premier architects, and we love everything they do, right? So we're, I don't doubt that we're going to come back and say that this is important historically and that we should preserve it. That's a separate question. That doesn't deal with this process that took place where we told this man he, he, he should not have to worry about that and he should go forward. That's the real challenge that we have. And so the questions before us in terms of trying to figure out what's equitable and fair to this man is how do we then, how does this person get compensated and, you know, measure their, their loss for all their efforts? Yeah. And I... I if I could tag along with the idea that if it's been nominated already through another procedure uh, and then now it's council, no, it's, it's nominated through council action, what, what's the difference and does one conflict with the other or just all in one? So even if we do today's action, it really wouldn't have an effect or impact on the commission, the, the planning department doing its review, right? You're doing that anyway, correct? Well, correct. Again, we have a nomination that was submitted. Uh, separately, we have a council motion. So again, we, it, this has come to us from two outside parties, one a member of the public and one a member of this council, and we are going through our Cultural Heritage Commission review. The, there is a difference in the code uh, in that if there is a council-initiated uh, nomination, the matter automatically comes back before the council, whether or not the commission uh, recommends yay or nay on the uh, on the nomination. Uh, typically, if it is a third-party initiated nomination, if the Cultural Heritage Commission votes no, uh, the matter comes, uh, the matter is dead at that point. It does not go oh, on to I council. See. You only see those that uh, have been voted on in the affirmative by the commission. With a council-initiated nomination, uh, the matter automatically comes back to the council for final, final decision. It would be routed through Plum before going to the full oh, council. council. Any other questions, Mr. Sidium? I had asked you about your email. Do you know what your email said? Do you have uh, a copy of it? I, you know, I apologize. I don't have a copy of that here uh, here today. Um, I think it's very possible that, um, you know, perhaps all the permutations and all the caveats in terms of how they would proceed maybe weren't in that email. Usually when I have a phone conversation, however, with someone, I, uh, and we get, get these calls very frequently just asking, is my property, has it been identified through Survey LA? And typically when it's a phone conversation, I do take the opportunity to indicate that's not necessarily the end of the story. You need to do additional due diligence of your own, uh, perhaps commission a site-specific historic resource assessment. You can kind of talk them through that type of analysis. Typically when, when there's a shorter email exchange and a more direct question, it's difficult to uh, provide all those caveats. 
So do you have that type of disclaimer when you give it? I mean, it's great to yes. have you in the office as a resource. I mean, it's called the Office of Historical <laughs> Resources. Right. It's great to have that resource, but if the reliance that people have upon that advice, that informal advice, uh, may create some liability for the city. Uh, do you provide some type of disclaimer that this is not the thorough research and I don't know what the legal language well, is? Well, SurveyLA does, you know, again, this is much more information than we've ever had on our historic resources in the city. This is the first time we've ever been able to take a comprehensive look and identify significant resources across the city. Um, frankly, had we never done a survey uh, of the my, city, my we may be is, in the same place. Do you place. provide a disclaimer on your emails when you provide advice to the public? Um, not a formal disclaimer, but it, often additional information, uh, again, of factors to consider, additional opportunities to, uh, to submit information or do more detailed research. Uh, again, we do uh, you know, a significant amount of work as part of these surveys. We're very proud of the work that, that's gone into that. The one thing we have not been able to do is actually pull all of the permits on all 880,000 properties in the city. So, and that's where, in this case, had we pulled the original building permit, we would have seen it was uh, an AC Martin design structure. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, um, I'm inclined to um, move this item, uh, and if we need a vote, we could take a vote um, uh, with the amendment. Uh, provided by Mr. Englander that we get a legal analysis as to any potential legal issues, including possible takings, uh, and that we get that provided should this come back to council. Um, and again, my view on this is, although there, I want to thank my colleagues for raising some very uh, good concerns. Uh, this is initiating the process, so we do have to look at this again, should we feel comfortable or not, and in that evaluation we could also examine whether or not we thought this was fair, uh, and at the end of the day it's council discretion uh, whether we do um, uh, uh, act upon this nomination. So, okay. any uh, should we take a roll call vote or should we send this forward? Okay, Mr. Sidio, or do you want to take a pass on this? So we'll move this uh, forward with a yes, uh, Mr. Englander and Mr. Weezer. Okay, and I just want to state that, yeah, my yes vote is um, uh, with a bad taste in my mouth over the process. And, uh, yeah. and I only support uh, the chairman's recommendation because he accepted the friendly amendment for the legal analysis, but also that it, this only initiates a process that's going to come back to this body, so it's only initiating the beginning of the conversation. So, yeah. thank, you. thank you. And again, we should also um, discuss uh, with the office and the planning department in general should discuss whether or not you know we should provide or have some type of disclaimer in our advice we give to these informal inquiries that we get. I know there's a number of them. So we would need to uh, make sure if in fact our city attorney's office would need to provide some type of legal disclaimer. I know uh, what was the answer was that we provide you know additional language such as this is not a thorough review. You should also look here and there. But it all comes down to as well uh, some legal issues and even the legal disclaimer could kind of alert people that, hey, you do need to do your due diligence even more so than you already have than just calling the office. So um, we will have to redo the vote. But now I don't have uh, my other uh, vote here, so we're going to have to hold this item. Because I think, uh, Ms. Uh, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so. You want me? We're going to have to hold this right now until I, I, Mr. Englander comes back. You want me to do a courtesy for him? Um, well, you got to do what you would like to do. No, we, we'll hold it. We'll hold it right now. Okay. So we'll hold this uh, on the desk until we get Mr. Englander back. So, next item, please. Uh, the next item, Councilman, is a motion, uh, Wesson, Bonin, LaBange, 
Um, it's asking for a report to be prepared by the CAO as lead with the assistance of the CLA and, and the city attorney and other departments to report back on the sharing economy concept. This item was um, considered by Economic Development Committee and it was amended and those amendments uh, are reflected by requesting that the CAO be the lead and prepare uh, the report. Okay. So now we gotta get the right oh, yeah, yeah. people in. <laughs> Let's hold this side up and go back to okay. item number four and take a vote on that item and we will move that item uh, as amended by Mr. Englander uh, to the full council. Okay. And with no objection, being that Mr. Englander and Weez are, are present. Okay. Thank you. And the motion gets adopted. The motion is adopted as okay. amended. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next item is five. We read that into the record. Yes, uh, Do we have staff here on item number five? Or do we have the maker of the motion, Mr. Wesson's office, whatever? Wait, why don't we yes, have Mr. Mr. Wesson's. Council President's uh, office come up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, Justin Wesson, legislative deputy for Council President Herb Wesson. Just here to read a letter into the record on behalf of the council president. Uh, dear council member Weezar and committee members, before you today is council file number 14-0593, motion Bond and Wesson asking for the formation of a working group to study and develop a comprehensive report on the sharing economy and its impacts on the city in Los Angeles. The intent of this motion is not to support nor denounce the sharing economy, it is simply an instruction that the city form a working group to further study the industry so that the city council, as policymakers, can make more informed policy decisions as it relates to the sharing economy. I feel that more information is required before the city takes any steps in developing legislation regarding the sharing economy, and thus the most appropriate first action to be taken is the formation of the working group. Lastly, in asking for the working group to study the potential benefits the sharing economy might have on the city, I did not anticipate that it would be interpreted as an endorsement of support. I do not believe that in asking a group to study the benefits should mean that they would ignore the potential negative impacts and that these, industry, that these industries could have on our neighborhoods and communities. However, emails and phone calls from the public have shown me that the wording in this motion has been taken as such so as a point of clarification, I therefore ask that the members of this committee amend the language of the motion to instruct the working group to study both the positive and negative impacts of the sharing economy industries and ask that you support the approval of this motion as amended. Thank you. Mr. Englander? Um, yeah, I support it moving forward. It's just a study, but I appreciate the updated language. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Tricia Keene. Uh, also from Council District 11. Good afternoon, Trisha Keene, Director of Land Use and Planning for Councilman Mike Bonin. Um, I'm here on behalf of Councilmember Bonin to just add a few additional remarks um, in support of this motion as amended. Um, we obviously support the idea of a comprehensive study of this issue and think Comprehensively studying the sharing or peer-to-peer -peer economy is an important step that the city can take. Um, but one thing that we would like to keep in mind as we move forward with the study of the issue is particularly related to the shared housing aspect of the, or the short-term rental aspect of the shared economy. Um, are situations in which this becomes an opportunity for um, hotels or motels in disguise in our residential neighborhoods. Um, when we have situations where entire apartment buildings are being purchased and then turned over into short-term rentals rather than uh, I think the way the model was intended to work initially, those can present some negative consequences for the neighborhood. So we would like that issue to be studied in the, st in the um, uh, study that is called for in this motion. But otherwise, we would like to see this study move forward and ask for your support of this motion today. Thank you. So uh, I will go through and ask, uh, I'll name two uh, speakers, and just so the second speaker, the second name is aware of who they're on the batter's box. Michael Millman and then Marsha Goldfinger. Uh, good afternoon, Michael Millman. I'm from Mar Vista. 
Um, I support the study group. I just want to make sure that we have in the study group people who provide housing. So my group and my organization are responsible for, for one million, one million units of housing, the apartment owners. We should be at the table and we should be showing leadership on this issue. It's our apartment units that are being taken over by illegal tenants who are now going Airbnb and the RSO has us strangled so we can't do anything. We want to be at the table. We want to show leadership. We want to be positive on this issue. But it's the apartment owners now that are being hurt because under the RSO and no leadership at LAHD that we can't do anything to stop this bleeding out of affordable housing by people coming in to make a quick buck. So can, please consider Agla and others when you do the group. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Marsha Goldfinger, Laura Hazark, Hazar. Good afternoon. I'm Marsha Goldfinger. I have a single home that I, I, I share. Uh, my mother died at 102 of Alzheimer's disease, leaving me with $50,000 loan to pay off. And at the same time, I lost my investments and income during the economy downturn. I remain in my home, the old it's an old home, with an income of $600 from Social Security. Wondering how to make a living at the age of 79, I heard about shared living, and um, I decided to try it. I've been holding, I've been hosting since November 2013. Um, a couple, I had a couple from Amsterdam staying for five days. They went on the road for two weeks. Uh, they called, they suddenly called and asked if they could come and stay for two nights before leaving. Um, their luggage had been stolen. Thank you. You, uh, you could wrap up, wrap up your thought or your sentence. Thank you. We were told we had two minutes. No, sorry about this. Uh, shared minute. income um, has helped me to be independent. I just installed a new air conditioner uh, and heating and air system, system in my old home. Thank um, you. Thank, thank you very much. Laura and Robert Stennis. Hello. Hello. I'm Laura. I live in Encino with my husband, Chris, and I'm just here to kind of put a face to a host in Los Angeles up in the valley. Um, we've been hosts for Airbnb since the beginning of the year. Um, and for us, we are first-time homeowners, so it's, you know, we never could have estimated how much money that costs. So Airbnb has been a nice um, thing for us to make some extra cash so we can enjoy the city like we love to. Um, We've hosted people from all over the world, the Netherlands, France, Italy, Spain, China, the list goes on. And it's so much fun to get to know people um, from all over the world. We become friends with them. Um, they leave us notes at the end of their trip offering to um, host us in their home country. So we have a place to stay in Venice, Buenos Aires, if we ever get there. Um, we always recommend local places to our guests. They're usually on foot. They don't rent cars, so they... Um, enjoy local vendors, grocers, cafes. I'm wrapping up. Um, and so it's definitely helped our community in Encino. It's mutually beneficial for us and the guests, and we would support anything to learn more about this. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Stennis, you'll help me with the last name. Vanessa Johnson. Hi, my name is Robert St. Janice, and I live in CD14. When we first signed up to host with Airbnb, we were a bit speculative, but we quickly found out to be a great experience. And Airbnb to work with was great, and their process of screening guests, very reassuring. We have never had a bad experience with Airbnb in over a year and a half. Shortly after starting, my husband's 25-year career came to an unexpected end. He was given an early retirement and a severance package, but now the income from Airbnb made it more important in sustaining ourselves. By January of this year, had it not been for Airbnb, we would have been forced to move out of our home and not sure what would have happened. I don't make enough in my small nonprofit position to pay our rent. The severage package had lasted only so long. My husband's unemployment was cut off by Congress, and he was still looking for work. From January till June, 
When my husband found new employment, Airbnb was a lifeline that kept us afloat. We continue with Airbnb as it makes it possible for us to donate more money to charity, to political campaigns, and to build a savings for the home we intend to buy in the future. Our housekeeper, who lives in CD13, has also benefited from Airbnb. The income from Airbnb has kept us from ever having to terminate her relationship and, in fact, increase some of her hours. Thank you. What, what neighborhood do you live in? Bunker Hill. I walk Bun here. Bunker Hill? Okay, great. Thank you. Vanessa Johnson, David Juarez. Hello, my name is Vanessa Johnson, and I thank you for letting me appear before the committee. Um, I am an Airbnb host. I'm in South Los Angeles, and I take care of my terminally ill husband. It provides me an income in South Los Angeles. It improves my neighborhood. My, my neighbors are very um, welcoming of my guests from all over the world. And it provides, also, I provide employment for a housekeeper that I would never be able to have. And she is on a part-time basis. I pay taxes. I pay uh, payroll taxes as well as um, taxes to the city for every guest that I have, uh, 14%. So thank you, and please consider us. Uh, we need this uh, to the city as well as to me as income, as well as to the businesses in my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. David Juarez, David Owen. Good afternoon, Councilmember Weizar, Councilmember Cedillo. My name is David Juarez, and I'm here representing AGLA, the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. And I would like to express our support in creating a working group to deal with the sharing economy and our interest in joining that working group once it's created. We believe we can provide valuable input into the conversation. We do, we've been monitoring sharing economy throughout the nation and we will like to be part of the, have a seat at the table once this working group is created. Great. Thank you. David Owen, Inja Yates. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. David Owen from Airbnb. Um, very excited to be here today, uh, very supportive of the motion. Um, we at Airbnb and our community know the economic benefits that home sharing and the peer-to-peer -peer economy generate here in Los Angeles, and we're excited that the city uh, is considering moving forward with studying those further. Um, our, our community currently exists of about 4,500 hosts uh, here in Los Angeles, and we know that the economic activity that they generate both just directly by hosting as well as bringing guests. Nearly 250,000 have come through Airbnb to Los Angeles since our company was founded in 2008. We're very excited about that and we look forward to working with the city as this discussion moves forward and others uh, around regulation or other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Inya Yates, James Yates. Good afternoon and thank you for having the opportunity to speak I'm Jim Yates, and my, my wife, Inja, uh, we have been home sharing as husband and wife for 54 years. But home, sh home sharing, we just began uh, with the Airbnb, and we're very, very supportive of uh, how we can build unity among people. We have brought people from many different countries have come to our home. And in addition, my wife and I have a college scholarship foundation where we provide financial assistance to students in not only in the Los Angeles area, but from all over the country, but mostly here. And uh, students who are working to build bridges between people, we find is a very, very important factor in uh, selecting uh, col uh, college applicants. And so far, we've given 22 scholarships of $2,000 each to those students. And Thank you. Uh, Airbnb has helped us to Can provide I speak that. On behalf yeah, of you have one minute as okay. well, ma'am. We started a scholarship in 2002, and I babysat the children to support the scholarship. As you can see now, physically, I cannot do it. But then we find out that Airbnb 
can help us continue to the scholarship. And currently, we have a students going to Stanford University, three of them. And throughout this country, the successful rate, 22 people we give a scholarship. All of them, except the one, did not graduate college. So I think this A and B and B will help us to continue this scholarship. I hope so. Thank you. Great, thank you. I would have been much happier if you would have said UC Berkeley. Three went to UC Berkeley instead of Stanford, but thank you. <laughs> we have two bears up here. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Jane Taguchi, Dennis Carpels. Thank you. My husband and I have lived in Silver, our Silver Lake home for 18 years. It has been a wonderful place to live. That is, until an Airbnb host bought the house across the street in April. I am currently in a battle with the owners of that house. Why? Because I and my neighbors are trying to stop the illegal rental. We are using all available legal means. They, there have been problems, but I can't get into the details. The property owners know they are operating an illegal hotel-style uh, rental, and, are in, and I'm in great fear that uh, they are in great fear that I and my neighbors are trying to stop their illegal cash flow. It is like a hotel, but this is a residential neighborhood. They are not sharing; they're selling. They don't even live there. On their Airbnb listing, it says minimum stay is one night. This is clearly illegal. The same Airbnb host has a second home that they rent out in Los Feliz with customer reviews, which prove they have rented it out for at least 14 months. So the house across the street is their second non-owner occupied illegal rental. So why am I telling you this? Because I want uh, to, to, to please be aware of what Airbnb does. They facilitate short-term rentals, which are illegal. Uh, I want to suggest that Airbnb not be put as a major part of this group. Rather, the work group should be balanced. The motion is ambiguous, hard to understand. Its scope is way too big. I feel the motion should be scrapped or at least heavily amended to be more concise, clear, and fair. If not, then it's like having the fox in the hen house. Thank you. Dennis Carpels. Good afternoon. And then after that, good afternoon, is Diana Hammond. Good afternoon. My name is Dennis Carpellis, and I'm president of an HOA in the Playa del Rey area on 63rd. And um, I can tell you already, um, I don't want to go into who it is, but in our neighborhood there are people already doing short-term rentals illegally. Uh, people are drunk and disorderly on the beach. I've witnessed fires on the beach. There's no supervision. There's no police. Uh, the next day, garbage, beer bottles all over the place. Uh, we just had whatever festival, some buses drove up two weekends ago, 40 people got out. Uh, they were not only drunk and disorderly, but there's no supervision whatsoever. You know, for us as residents, you know, our children are there, our grandchildren are there, and I'm asking the city council and the planning department just to be real careful <clears throat> pardon me, insofar as what's the rules, you know, it's almost like CC and ours. If you're going to take a residential district, really in essence what you're doing is placing a PUD over it, a planned unit development, and you're changing the zoning. That's a very drastic thing because we bought in a whole Thank you. bunch of us, you know, as you. residents. And my last point is liability. I mean, those people were just carousing till 3 4 o'clock in the morning and that's a nuisance what happens when we're calling the police all the time thank you or, or you know a fire on the beach thank you for listening thank you diana Hammond. i'd like to suggest that you remove the term sharing economy from your deliberations this isn't a new economy or a new business model what your committee is addressing is the need for standard limitations and regulation of property rentals. And short-term property rentals in Los Angeles desperately need limits and regulations, as my neighborhood has found. Short-term rental agencies claim that they self-regulate. This is not true. VRBO customer service reps respond to complaints by stating that they are merely brokers and have no responsibility for the actions of people who use their website as a business. If after two days of calls, Airbnb finally picks up their hotline phone, 
The rep will be sympathetic, say that they do not condone this behavior, and will promise to call you back within 48 hours, and you will never hear from them again. The citizens of Los Angeles need protection from these short-term rental businesses, and to learn more, visit a website called airbnbhell.com. It's a thorough guide to the abuses that need to be addressed by your committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That ends our public speakers. And um, this is a motion that asks for the uh, creation of a working group to address some of the issues that were raised. Uh, there was uh, This item was heard in the Economic Development Committee with some amendments. Uh, we had a request today from the Council President's Office, who is also the maker of the motion, to add and amend that this will study both the benefits and impacts of uh, the study. I think that's what I got from the public, from council, from the council president's public comments. Uh, so we will amend it uh, accordingly. And councilman, just yeah. to be clear, among the amendments that the economic development committee uh, approved was to strike uh, this concept of a working group. The directive is for the CAO as lead to prepare the report with the assistance of CLA and various departments. So that was a major change. Okay, and that as well. We'll make those two uh, those two amendments. Yes. Okay. And uh, my personal view is that you know we should uh, allow this emerging industry um, to uh, continue as it allows for more convenience. Um, helps people, but at the same time, we need to strike that balance with local communities that um, need protections, and that uh, we do need regulations. As when any new industry is emerging, that could be beneficial for its customers as well as the communities. Uh, we should allow it, but we do need regulations, and it seems like we are unregulated in this area now. There's issues, uh, legal issues. There are community concern issues. Um, tax issues, there's a number of issues uh, that hopefully this uh, group could come up with and recommend uh, to this council for action. Uh, the one request I have, and I'm not going to put it in an official uh, amendment, is that this motion does seem too broad for me. It, you know, it's, it could mean a, a hundred different emerging industries in the shared economy, whether it's transportation, housing, or street vendors as somebody brought up earlier in, in the previous committee just it, it's it's very broad so i would hope that through the leadership of the council president's office who made the motion working with the cao and cla you could narrow it and figure out what exactly do we want to look at um in in this uh sure and, if, and in fact the uh the draft economic development committee report uh alluded to the fact that housing and transportation were focus issues okay so. good all righty so any other questions, comments? No. Um, I think one of the areas that, that emerges in the discussions is a, obviously a clear divide. Is the question of, uh, here it indicates consumer to consumer, but one of the issues that gets raised is um, non-owner occupier, right? So when you're renting from someone who is not the owner uh, and, they're, and they're not uh, even present in some instances, we, we will take that into uh, consideration when we meet with the CAO and the departments and mention your concerns. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll move this item to full council and uh, with the amendments that were just made. No objections ordered. Next item. Uh, next item, Councilman, is a uh, draft uh, ordinance uh, being submitted by the Planning Department relative to the transfer of the CRA functions uh, to that department. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Olivo with the City Planning Department. Um, a little background first. Uh, in early 2012, the dissolution of the Community Redevelopment Agency in Los Angeles took effect. Uh, state legislation was later passed that allows the city to assume all land use related, uh, land use -related plans and functions of a former redevelopment agency upon request. Um, as a result, the City Council instructed the Department of City Planning to prepare an ordinance that would transfer the redevelopment uh, land use plans and functions to the City of Los Angeles. 
There are currently 21 redevelopment plans in existence, and the successor agency to the CRA is uh, implementing them with a skeleton crew. They have requested that the city assume these uh, functions from them. Uh, the plans are necessary because they are located in parts of the city with uh, the greatest need for investments. Uh, greater regulatory certainty is needed to help incentivize investments in the areas. Uh, the plans also offer neighborhood protections such as prohibition of pole signs, uh, auto-related uses, and historic preservation protections. Um, what is before you today is a request to transfer the land use plans and functions from the CRA to the City of Los Angeles. It essentially has two parts. Um, an ordinance and a resolution. Via the resolution, the Department of City Planning will assume responsibility to implement land use provisions in the redevelopment plans. As part of this, the Office of Historic Preservation will assume the responsibility to oversee historic preservation protections in, re in redevelopment project areas. Uh, with the ordinance, this, uh, the ordinance will eliminate or amend references to the CRA and the CRA board so that the planning, so planning staff can process cases in a manner that is consistent with the zoning code and other land use regulations. Uh, this item went to the City Planning Commission on May 8th, and it is recommended that the City Council adopt the proposed resolution, ordinance, and findings. Uh, also recommended is that the resolution and ordinance are exempt from CEQA. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce a technical uh, correction to the ordinance before you. We have added provisions since this was uh, before the CPC to allow for the administration of redevelopment plans. In short, we have included mechanisms for project case processing that mimic uh, procedures in the code right now for specific plans and community plan implementation overlays um, so that uh, pro uh, applicants um, have a good understanding of, of what's before them. This concludes my presentation and uh, staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Um, I have two quick questions and one is the, we have these redevelopment plans uh, still in existence. Uh, each one has a expiration timeline. Uh, Correct. Or, or is there some drop dead? All plans are going to no longer exist with the uh, state legislation. Each plan has its own deadline. So those can those continue according to when the original. Yeah, uh, the, the last one I believe is like 2033. Okay, TFAR. Um, we recently did one or two. Uh, TFAR deals uh, in downtown. Does that and they they had to go to the I think it was a three member panel or uh, for the CRA. Did, are those going to continue to go there or just this that that's one example of bringing the authority over to the city that the planning department will now review that. Correct. That is one example of that just coming straight to the city planning. Okay. Uh, commission. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of few speakers. Yeah, Fran Offenhauser and then John Guerrero. Sure, if she wants to permit you to. Uh, John Giroto with Hollywood Heritage. Hollywood Heritage cooperated with the CRA for over 25 years and participated fully in CRA planning and enforcement actions as they affected Hollywood, one of the city's richest and, and best known landmarks. In those 25 years, the CRA did all the fine grain preservation planning for Hollywood, conducting the historic survey, mapping the National Register Historic District, creating specific plans under requirements to do fine grain planning specifically to protect historic buildings. The CRA had better funding and in the early days, a full planning department. The CRA carried all of this, not the city planning department. It is clear how important the preservation of world-famous Hollywood is. It has taken years of hard work, historic surveys, planning, and building permit review, building by building. Today we ask you to correct a major omission in the case before you. We are asking you to make sure there is no break now as the Department of City Planning takes over the planning and the specific protections of historic buildings. You are transferring the authority and the functions of the CRA, but we need to see a requirement to assure this will happen without a break. Thank you. Thank you. Fran Elfenhauser. Good afternoon. I'm Fran Offenhauser. I was a founder of Hollywood Heritage. I also, by as a professional, drafted the 1986 Hollywood Community Plan when it was taken out of the planning department and done privately at Gruen Associates. I worked uh, on the CRA PAC and drafted the language in the redevelopment plan for historic preservation. And I want to follow up on what John said. I don't know, should I wait for the... It, it's okay. Uh, I want to follow up on what John said. 
We are very concerned, and I think on the card we put that we are opposed to the moving of the CRA's planning responsibilities over to planning. It's not that we're opposed to it. It's that the timing of this is such. There's 25 years of very detailed planning. There are databases that are so large they'll crash your computer. There are requirements in the Hollywood redevelopment plan that require that the redevelopment agency do certain things. They can't be transferred instantly. And what we're asking is that you put some kind of clause in here so that these functions, the, the the case says that the functions of the CRA are transferred to planning, that those functions get transferred without a break. And the reason that I'm saying this is that at the moment there's an avalanche of demolition applications for Hollywood. And as we all know, Hollywood is fundamental. Hollywood Thank preserved. You. So Thank you. just if I could conclude that we're not asking for a moratorium. We're asking that there be a clause, that there be no break. It may involve a continuation of current CRA staff for a period of time to deal with an overlap period. But we ask you to please add a clause to that effect. Thank you. With that, if I, I could call staff up and, and uh, can I get staff? Oh I, oh, I didn't see him here. We got one more speaker. You're hiding back there. Um, Doug Haynes. I, I didn't see you, so I thought you had left. Uh, but it's my mistake. I should call the name even. Uh, that's speaker. okay. I like to be in the corner where I'm not really visible all that often. Yeah. Um, I, just to ditto what Fran said, there's no objection regarding moving forward on certain aspects of this plan. But I want to specifically ask a question for staff, and that's and for the city attorney. That's on page 16 of the proposed ordinance, uh, section 27. Uh, where it says section 1605 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code is amended to read as follows. Any development project located within the boundaries of an adopted redevelopment project area shall be exempt from site plan review and list A, B, and C. You're crossing out C, which had restricted um, this section to the downtown housing and setting area. I'm curious why that's being done, and the reason I'm raising that issue is because in Hollywood, um, projects do come back. We have a project right now, the Sunset Gordon project, which is going back for new entitlements. This would prevent site plan review from being applicable to that, and that's an important and crucial element of the review of this project since they illegally demoed the old spaghetti factory building, which is supposed to be preserved. So if I can get an answer, I'd appreciate that. Great. Thank you. So if we could have staff come up, please. And uh, number one, um, one of the issues raised by the public speakers is if uh, there's going to be any gap in services. And secondly, the other issue raised is whether uh, the functions can be efficiently transferred. And finally, the third uh, question by Mr. Uh, Haynes, if you could answer that. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Patricia Diefender for Planning Department staff. Um, question, sorry, the first question was, the, oh yeah, transition time, pardon me. Um, tran apparently the state law just says that the transition happens immediately. So upon this, the council approving this, planning takes over the uh, land use controls and functions immediately. Okay. okay. Um, efficiency? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, with respect to, I mean, we have the Office of Historic Resources that provides this function throughout the city. Um, they would be uh, continuing to do, and uh, they would assume that responsibility here in cooperation with um, planners in the department who review specific projects. So this is something that we, the planning department, the staff of the planning department does do this kind of um, review of historic resources and gives input on that. So that would not be a function that's um, uncommon for the for the staff in the planning department through the Office of Historic Resources. I don't know if um, anyone else has anything to add. And then um, finally, in response to the last uh, question or item that was discussed, um, with regard to downtown, um, there are a lot of overlapping provisions that, that are really confusing because right now you currently have some CRA and planning department responsibilities, and what we try to do was clarify that to the extent possible. Um, 
we are still you know, going to have a final look at this with the city attorney's office to make sure that there's nothing here that uh, that there are any gaps in this. So um, that's the best that I can do to, to answer that. So I, I think we, we we made sure that there weren't any gaps, and we'll take one final look at that. Sorry, Patricia Diefendo for uh, planning staff. The question of that site plan review exemption, actually that is a clarification. Um, the, this site plan review exemption essentially said that uh, projects don't have to go through site plan review if they meet the downtown design guide, but that's created some interpretation problems. So this is actually an attempt to fix that and it in ensures that projects that otherwise would meet site plan review thresholds it, it clarifies that those projects actually do have to go through site plan review. So this would not um, exempt any projects from site plan review. And in fact, uh, the provision was um, somewhat unclear previously, and we're trying to clarify that. Okay. Uh, count, uh, council member, I'd like to just uh, add a, a couple of comments. Uh, in our current budget, we have about uh, $900,000 actually in general fund uh, to initiate this transfer and then uh, six additional positions. So in order for us to uh, assume this day-to-day -day administrative responsibility, we would need to staff up in order to effectuate the transfer. So uh, Ms. Dieffendorfer is correct in stating that under the state law provisions uh, that the effective date of the resolution, the authority is transferred. Uh, I believe we want to work with the city attorney to actually cement uh, into the resolution an operative date that council would then select so that uh, when council does adopt the resolution, we would identify with uh, the redevelopment agency an appropriate operative date, and we could select that operative date based upon administrative convenience in terms of our ability to staff up uh, this particular function and then address some of the other issues that have been raised by Hollywood Heritage to make sure that we have a smooth transfer. So I would recommend not uh, identifying that operative date today, uh, but that we uh, recommend that when it comes back to this uh, uh, committee, which it will have to after the city attorney completes its review for form and legality. So when, when do you recommend we get the operative date? Uh, it, at this point, we would recommend that this be moved to the city attorney for final uh, drafting okay. of the legislation for form and legality. At that point, that may take a period of some time. Uh, typically, we would then come back to this committee uh, and at that point, uh, the committee will have a second chance to weigh in on this issue, and at that point, we can identify the appropriate operative date. Okay, sounds good. And um, now, the, the staff you're planning for is more staff than what CRA, CRA currently has, correct? We have the authority up to six positions, and then uh, we have... My question is, how many do, does the CRA have now? That I don't know. Yeah, I get the sense that they're skeletal over. I think they probably have about, I think, three. Two, two or three people yeah, working yeah. on these things. Okay. We certainly won't staff up beyond what is necessary to administer the program. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I sit on the uh, Grand Avenue Authority with the current executive director for CRA, and I think uh, I ask him, so is your staff going to look into it? And I think he's playing both roles. He's the executive director and all staff, so they're, they're very uh, minimal over there. And I think it's created some issues and confusion um, as to how do we get cl uh, clarity on what's going on with some of these project areas and projects and as well as just moving things uh, in a timely manner through the process. So I think that's going to be a lot of help. So we'll do that. We'll um, move forward with some of the direction that was provided by the Sh planning staff. Sure. Um, so it'll be the request to the city attorney to prepare uh, the ordinance and I think the planning department also submitted technical changes uh, in addition, um, to request that when the city attorney prepares the ordinance that they know that the name of CDD uh, has been changed to the Economic and Workforce Development because in the draft document it still makes reference to CDD and housing is now the Housing and Community Investment Department. Yes, sir. This is a deal agrees. Can I get the right name in there? Okay, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could go back to item number, what, oh, what number? Yes, uh, if we could b go back to item five on the sharing economy, item councilman, if we can also strike uh, any reference to a stakeholder group in addition to the working group, um, that, that would be requested. That way it could be reflected in the committee report. 
Yes, if we could do that, because I think the intent of the council president's uh, amendment was to have the CLA and CRO. Uh, yeah, the CAO would be the lead with the CLA and, and the. Have, not have the typical working group sure. as it's become a term of art in right. the council to include all these different groups. It's more, okay. Yeah, and fine. if you could reopen the item and reconsider it. We could, uh, is there a motion? A motion to uh, reconsider item so five, seconded by Mr. Cedillo, and we'll make those amendments as sure. stated, uh, and then uh, without objection, move. we'll move by Mr. Cedillo, no objections, and we'll order that. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, uh, there's a public comment card, Councilman. Thank you, sir. Doug Haynes. I'll be real quick, just uh, to keep you. Uh, a couple of months ago, I came and spoke, you weren't here, Councilman Weiser, when I spoke about Measure D. And I said it was finally working because the dispensary I've been coming here for five years and griping about was finally shutting down. But guess what happened? They didn't. They just closed the doors, turned off the lights, and now they're doing free delivery. So they haven't left. What we've been told by Narco is that uh, they're going to do a search warrant. I was told that a month and a half ago. It still hasn't happened. So in our neighborhood, it just doesn't seem to be functioning. We don't know what to do. I've been coming and complaining to you for all these years. We tried the ban. That didn't go through. Measure D was passed. And yet they're still there, and there's still marijuana smoke still wafting into everyone's home next door, and they just never seem to go away. So, and in fact, they said originally to Narco that they were going to move to a marijuana dispensary that had been forced out. So they got the owner to say, okay, I'll rent to you now, even though the police kicked the other people out. And Narco said, no, you can't do that. So uh, we don't know what to do. If you have any ideas, please help us out. Okay, thank you. My idea is we've got to change state law on that, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Friend Offenhauser. I just wanted to thank you for hearing us and to say that of the three positions or however many there are left at CRA, one of those has been allocated specifically for the implementation of historic preservation in Hollywood. And what is happening in the transfer, even though the planning department is getting six, they have been telling us they cannot continue the activities with the six that they're getting, which is why we came here. We don't like to come and do this. So I appreciate that your point is that there is a, a span of time and there may be an ability to affect a changeover that isn't instant. There's a, a tremendous amount of mapping and databases and such that has to transfer and it doesn't happen overnight. So I really appreciate your help on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our meeting. Yes, sir. This meeting is adjourned.